Hello there, it's Antrice, and welcome to another episode of the Savvy Painter Podcast. Savvy Painter is the podcast for painters who know that mastering your craft is a lifelong venture. They understand that the hardest part is showing up every day, whether they're inspired or not, and that we're all in this together. For the past three years, the Savvy Painter podcast has been sharing tips and techniques that you can use every day in your studio. And when you join the Savvy Painter email list now, you get a collection of inspiring quotes and practical advice collected from years of Savvy Painter interviews. Just go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash subscribe to sign up for weekly emails and get your free PDF, Essential Tips for Artists. Each week, I interview established artists like Anne Gale, Scott Connery, Rebecca Crowell, and many other artists who are willing to open their studio doors, share their painting processes, and talk candidly about what it takes to consistently grow your skills. We get into the nitty gritty of their daily studio practice, what tricks they play on themselves to avoid getting caught up in perfectionism, how to use flashcards as reminders to stay on track during long painting sessions, and other cool tactics to quiet the inner critic and continue moving towards excellence. The Savvy Painter Podcast is filled with artists who generously share their stories, and by sharing their stories, they show the rest of us that we are not alone. So join us with the Savvy Painter email list and get even more connected with weekly emails. Sign up now and you get essential tips for artists, the inspiring quotes and practical advice collected from years of Savvy Painter interviews. Go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash subscribe. It's that easy. This week, my guest is Frank Lombardo. Frank is a figurative painter working out of North Carolina. His paintings have been on display at the Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C. as part of the 2010 Outwin Bouchever Portrait Competition. One of his portraits, Monique, was featured in Art in America. In this episode, Frank and I talk about the advantage of being the less experienced artist in an art school filled with students who already have a head start. He also shares how he constructs his paintings and why the first 40 seconds of writing his intention is the most valuable. He also shares his fascination with the role of the artist as we enter into this new period of technology, artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, and all of the possibilities that we have absolutely no precedent for. It is a fascinating discussion. So please enjoy Frank Lombardo. Frank, welcome to the Savvy Painter podcast. I'm really excited to have you on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me here. I'm excited to be here. Can you tell me a little bit about how you got started as uh, an artist? I would love to hear what, you know, kind of what artists inspired you when you were young and when you when you decided that you were going to pursue this as your vocation. Sure, sure. So I would say before there was even like a single artist that kind of came along, it was probably more of kind of these like little reasons along the way. And, you know, in high school, I was always sort of trying to do what my friends were doing, which was sports, which I was never really great at, you know, too many of those. And then you've also got like, you know, the everybody's sort of feedback constantly as you're trying to get better at that kind of stuff. And I found painting and drawing to be this thing that like no one knew anything about. So I was just left on my own to just kind of pursue it. And that was such a huge relief. And I think like, from when I was, I don't know, 14 to 17, that was just huge. You know, it was just this thing I could meditate on by myself. I could just see myself slowly getting better at it. My parents were always really supportive. So my mom actually got me into uh, this kind of summer program at Maryland Institute College of Art. And there was an artist there, Professor Carl Connolly, and I was in his figure drawing class. And I would say he was the first sort of professional artist in the flesh that I met that really just kind of galvanized and inspired me and showed me that like, you can, you can do this, you can make money with this. There's no limit to how good you can get at it, all that kind of stuff. So he was a huge, huge influence. Mm. I'm always curious if there was any sort of pivotal moment when, when you were first kind of exploring the idea of becoming an artist that made you just say, yes, I'm doing this. Yeah, I can think of, okay, okay. I can think of a few things like that. So one is really shallow, but I'll admit it. It was probably the first time in high school that girls noticed me. I felt like, <laughs> like I was just doing, you know, I was doing this thing and all of a sudden, like all these popular pretty girls are like, 
oh, that looks really good. And can you, you know, paint a picture of me? And like, you know, they're like angry boyfriends are like looking over their shoulder at me. And, but it was, it was great. And I was like, this is, yeah, that was huge motivation right there. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Right. You know, so, and then things got, you know, I, I would say the next big thing was taking it really serious, going to college, being a freshman there. And I didn't even know what a magnet school was when I went to college. I didn't know that there were like these art-based miracle high schools uh-huh. that these people were going to. So like, they're just telling me like, oh yeah, I've had, I've had studio classes three hours a day, you know, for four years. And I'm like, what, what, what planet are you? <laughs> like I went to an awful public high school in New Jersey, you know, it was nothing like that. So it produced this moment of like, I'm going to sink or swim kind of thing. Like there were a lot of people there just like a lot better than me. Uh-huh. And I, I just got so frustrated, but I worked so hard and just, you know, I didn't party. I didn't do anything that freshman year. And I felt myself like just getting better than them. And that was just like a, I don't know, a kind of self-assured, like I can do this. I could be an artist. It might take like a ton of focus for me to overcome some of these hurdles. And like, you know, once the exponential gain is gone, when you're like trying to get good at something, like once right. those like first, yeah, that first year or whatever is gone. And then it's just like, you got to give it a hundred percent to get like a, a fraction of improvement. But, but I saw the improvement coming. So I, I just kind of committed, I, I would say like halfway into my freshman year there, like, it's just gonna, it's gonna happen. Nice. Yeah. Cause I can imagine that at first you have this feeling of intense, I'm sure competition because it sounds like you felt like you were already behind and you had some catching up to do. And then of course, you know, if you're starting at a certain level, And you're being exposed to all this new information and this ability to draw from the model and you have all these resources, then as you said, your, your learning curve is just, I mean, the amount that it takes to go from A to B is it's just a huge leap. And then it gets smaller and smaller and smaller because you're getting more and more refined. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, it was like a double-edged sword to have all these people around that were so much better than me because, you know, without that, if I just went to still being like a big fish in a small pond, there yeah. would have been no improvement. So it was, you know, I'm still good friends with a lot of those people and really lucked out with some of the like just genius freaks I had in my undergrad <laughs> class of painters that were just, yeah, you know, like just amazing, amazing painters. And, and yeah, yeah. Huge advantage. Intimidating as hell though. Yeah, I'm sure. I was just, I mean, this is a very strange comparison to make, I'm sure, but I was listening to this conversation with, oh God, what's her name? She's a tennis pro from Russia and Maria. Oh yeah. I think I might've just listened to the same conversation maybe. She was talking about how at a very, very young age, at like five or six years old, she got into this training camp for tennis pros. And it's one of the best, I'm not a huge tennis fan, so I don't know like all those details, but she was put into this tennis camp effectively that she was the youngest person there. And so she was playing against these kids that were older, had a lot more experience. They were bigger. They were, you know, two or three feet taller. And in hindsight, she was saying that was one of the best things that could have happened because it it just created this intense mindset for her of if somebody's just slightly better than you, then there's, you don't have this like huge leap to make this growth that you want to have. And so it sounds like you had that at that school. Absolutely. And and I know that I think I might have even listened to the interview or something, but I remember something about her even having like animal crackers in her locker yeah. or something like that. Like, like, you know, all these other girls were kind of like just starting to date and she like, you know, get back to her animal crackers and yeah, no, I can absolutely relate. I mean, it was, yeah, this magnet high school, this magnet artist high school thing was just such a crazy phenomenon to me. And, you know, it was kind of even early days of the internet there, like 98, where it's not like you're really Googling for that kind of stuff or or whatever. But uh, yeah, it was it was a huge advantage. It was, I lucked out with that, with how good they all were. Yeah, yeah. Can you, for people who haven't seen your work, would you... This is kind of a mean question to ask of an artist in some ways, because art obviously is so visual, but can you describe your work to people who haven't seen it yet? Yeah, sure. I, I usually sound like I'm uh, I'm on drugs when I'm trying to describe it. It's like just such a vague, I'm not great at it, but yeah, I can go for it. 
Well, okay, I would ask everybody to picture like Ecstasy of St. Teresa, that sculpture by Bernini. That's a good start. Mm -hmm. Most people have seen it. If you haven't, really easy to just pull up. But she's kind of leaning back and she's just got this cloth like flowing off her body around her. You kind of really can't even see her form very well because the cloth just kind of like takes precedent. And that sculpture had a lot of influence for me. So I, I sort of took that into my own work where I have these figures kind of buried in this cloth that just is sort of blowing in this kind of unseen wind and billowing and no real clear trajectory to any of it, sort of like overlapping, a lot of transparencies or translucent kind of areas to it. And then the figure, the, the figures themselves are usually echoed. There's usually like maybe three kind of primary faces or heads that are sort of overlaid and translucent and echoed and then like some more like hands doing the same thing. So you get this kind of like undulating movement thing where it's, uh, and it's all painted you know, what I'd call pretty realistically, but you've got this this slant on it with all these layers and transparencies. So yeah, that's probably as good as I words. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's I think that's so hard to answer in a in a very concrete way, I think, for a lot of people because it's kind of easier to just go, yeah, I'm a figurative painter. Or something really vague like that. So what is it that fascinates you about the subject matter that you choose? Yeah, good question. Let's see. I guess it's it's not something I saw in any sense, like right in the beginning, like I'm going this direction or anything. You know, in college, I primarily just painted men, actually, and didn't have any of this, like these women with all this cloth and stuff like that. But I think what's kept me here and keeping me interested is just this idea that in in some ways, it is kind of like my own. It's this subject matter and this style that's, you know, you don't see often. You'll see elements of it in all kinds of other art, but it's something that I can, I guess, have this kind of like, idiosyncratic sort of like foundation I can kind of build off of, you know, and keep, keep pushing. So I like that about it. And it's developed so slowly that it doesn't feel too much of a, a gimmicky niche to me. It feels like, like every little piece I keep adding on feels like it comes at a good pace. So like if I'm trying to put together a, comp- a composition or something, sometimes I'll start to write out like, like why I want to do that. Like what are the ideas I'm trying to convey? Mm-hmm. And I can usually do that for like 45 seconds and be honest and sincere. And then anything beyond that tends to be like really pretentious and just like, like I just have to laugh at myself and kind of <laughs> forget it, you know? And, and what I found is I just, I really just have to trust the image. Like, what do I want to see? And I can, I can always answer that sincerely. Like I want to see a centerless, you know, figure, like in a sense of kind of certain elements of maybe like Baroque architecture where there's like, there's no clear center uh-huh. And the viewers like constantly sort of engaged, contemplating, doesn't get too stuck in any one area. And it gives this sort of maybe this feeling of this kind of transhumanist spiritual thing. Or it's just really cool to people. That's fine, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some of that stuff. I'm fascinated by that one comment that you made that when you're writing it out, you get it in 45 seconds. And that after that, whatever you've written becomes really pretentious or or vague. So it sounds like your paintings are pretty intuitive in terms of how you choose your subject matter. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. In- intuitive and and slow, like like a slowly developed kind of intuition. How do you work? So for these paintings, the paintings I described, it would be a process of pretty involved, pretty involved. Like I'd get a model, I'd photograph the model, but I'd also get like a kind of outfit for them to wear and this cloth and, you know, I'd photograph them with the cloth. So I'd build up this huge database of these photos of hands of them doing different gestures, basically them posing, different lighting. And then I'll, I'll design that composition, usually on Photoshop, kind of like piece everything together, uh-huh. just this huge composite. And I'll try to get pretty close to what I would think the final image would be. You know, I try to really pretty much just lock down the composition digitally first and then use that as a reference when I'm painting it. So I kind of solve as many of those really complicated problems as I can and then go from there. And, you know, I'll make changes still, but that's kind of, yeah, that's it in a nutshell. That's the basis of it. Yeah. Interesting. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. I get it. That makes sense. Uh, Actually, for this painting, the series I'm going to do next, I'm actually having somebody make me a dress. Really? For the model to wear. Yeah. Because I, I just finished this really involved painting of Virgin Mary and I faked the dress in that and it, it came out fine. It worked great. But it was so much harder to fake a dress, to fake an outfit and fake sleeves and all that stuff, just kind of like with, with draped cloth. So did you basically take cloth and wrap it around the model? Is that what you mean when you say you faked it or exactly. did you make, okay, okay. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, it, we had a, I think I had a friend just basically like seam up the cloth and do some kind of like bare bone stuff. Right. So it wasn't just, you know. So it would stay on. <laughs> yeah. Like it yeah. would just, you know, I had a kind of sash and it was tied on and, you know, I would take a different photo for each sleeve sort of thing and merge them. And it was just, you know, I'd be way better off paying someone $200 to, to make me a dress and have an outfit and just, yeah. So I'm, I'm excited about that. That's like, it's going to be a huge time saver. How do you choose your subjects? You mentioned that you write out this 45, you write things out. I shouldn't be so fixated on the time, but you, you basically write out what you're thinking about. Can you articulate where that vision comes from? Yeah, yeah I can try. I can try. Uh, and there is, there is like some stuff I pull out of that, all that writing stuff that is good. It's just like, there's a lot of fat there, mm -hmm. but there's, there is, you, you know, even five or 10 minutes into that or an hour or whatever, I'll, I'll come to some thought that feels genuine. That doesn't feel like just artist statement, need juxtaposition, exploration, kind of, you know, right, words right. that you generally see in a gallery. Yeah. So one of the things that is starting to influence me a bit is this idea of, and this is still pretty, pretty foggy for me. I don't really have a, a concrete, I'm exploring this myself, but this idea of like a, how we're advancing right now and kind of this new, I don't know what you want to call it, with gene therapy and 3D printing and Elon Musk and space travel and all these crazy new possibilities that we're sort of encountering, coming up against, I feel like they're going to throw so many of our, uh, our foundational beliefs into this kind of disarray. You know, how do we handle having a, a colony on Mars if Elon ever gets his way with that? Or how do we handle reaching the state of quasi-immortality if, you know, gene therapy can really do all the stuff it promises? And I would love to kind of just be a part of this new mythology to kind of, I don't want to use the word comfort or anything or, or guide, but just like react to this like weird new displacement that we might feel if some of these, you know, Moore's law, exponential kind of things. I don't even say it, the, uh, oh, what is it? The um, realization of artificial intelligence, singularity, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> artificial intelligence. And then also what's kind of freaking me out a little bit is nanotechnology. When I first started hearing about this, I'm like, that is amazing. I've talked to eye doctors and, you know, people in the medical profession who talk about these microscopic little machines that can basically be implanted and affect your eyesight and all these wonderful things. And then you read that they're they're able to to put these on. What is it? Dragon? Have you heard this? That they're they're putting like little microchips on dragonflies, and with electric impulses, are able to direct where the dragonfly goes and put cameras on it. And in one way, it's really bizarre and cool, but in another way, that is just terrifying. <laughs> right. Like we have no precedent for how to deal with that. That's just and and no. yeah. What you said about the nano stuff is like you know Elon Musk's thousandth company that he just started or whatever is about the, just that being implanted in a human for like some kind of cognitive enhancement stuff in the brain. Yeah. So I, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by all this stuff and I, you know, I don't know about it in any, in any real way other than just being fascinated by it. Mm -hmm, me too. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and that's, I think that's all of us really, even, even people in the field that's so specialized now, I'm sure the people that work the cameras on the dragonfly probably don't know much about the controls on the dragonfly or maybe vice versa or something. It's a, uh, yeah, I would, I would love to somehow play a part in celebrating and, and yeah, just this, I, I just, this concept of like a new, we need maybe like a new mythology to kind of start to help us with all this stuff that we're about to get thrown into. Yeah. Yeah. It's so crazy. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so if, the, if that can guide like image choice for me in a sense, like I'll let it have a, a little say, but it's like you said, it's still pretty intuitive. For me, it's still kind of like I like for my next paintings, I've been picturing these women holding this skull and they're moving all around it. Like my my current paintings with the you know repetitions and echoes and the translucent things. But the skull is static. The skull is the only thing that's not moving. It'll be just one of them in the painting and sort of this idea of, you know, death static and life is kind of moving around it and possibly this kind of maybe Greek or Roman sort of what you think of as these cheesy like ruins, like the columns, that kind of stuff in like the background, but maybe with spray paint and stuff on them and this sense of like, we're kind of like leaving behind our foundation and like almost, almost even mocking it, whether we like it or not with this crazy new world we're kind of entering with all this stuff. Yeah. What I think is really interesting about your work is it does have that sort of marriage of, you know, it's got roots in the past, but it definitely 
has almost present or, or even futuristic references. That's great. Yeah, I, I hope it comes across like that. That's that's what I'm going for. You can say that. Yeah. What memorable responses have you had to your work? Have you ever had an experience that just sort of stands out of somebody seeing your work and reacting to it? Most recently, I am finally starting to be more aggressive with pursuing galleries. And, and I did get a little bit of positive feedback from Forum in New York. So that absolutely stands out to me, mm. even though it was just like a, you know, 10 word email. But it's a start. <laughs> it's, a start. it's a start. Yeah. So, so that's, that's probably the most recent uh, hopeful sign there. Besides that, it's kind of like, you know, you're in the studio for however many hours a day, a week, a month, a year, and you have this view of your work and it's, you know, you're exhausted to say the least. So yeah, it's when I finish something like that, I've had, I've had moments where somebody will see it and maybe they'll even like tear up or cry or a little, or they'll like, just send me this really long inspired letter about what I did. And that's not often, that's not every day or anything at all, but a few times it does happen. Yeah. It makes me feel pretty good. And like, I'm not wasting all my time here. Yeah. Doing this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so I have a couple of questions I want to, I want to ask you about that. And, and they're, we're going to jump around a little bit because they're not related. <laughs> okay. No problem. <laughs> So you mentioned that I know I'm going to get questions. I get questions about this all the time. So if you're willing to share it, what is your strategy for approaching a gallery? Oh, wow. You know, um, that's a tough one. Yeah. Yeah. Right now, my strategy is one a day, basically, or, or a publication a day or something a day and to turn it into a kind of a numbers game for me. Mm -hmm. I've gone about this completely backwards. I moved here and stayed here in Western North Carolina, where I'm at now, basically because I could, I could have this kind of like Shaolin monk temple of making art. You know, there was, I, I didn't have to have 10 jobs. I could afford it easy, but you know, there's no foot traffic here. There's no big galleries here. You don't get seen here. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to get this work that I felt like I could 100% stand behind and then pursue the galleries, which is not how it's typically done. Most people would be pursuing them like a long time before I did. And, I, and I've pretty much just been surviving off commissions. So that could be painting somebody's kids or basically anything they had in mind. And those paid really well. So the gallery thing, I, I'm definitely, I'm not qualified to answer that. Like how I, but but I'll, I'll tell you how I am doing it. Yeah, I'm just, I'm making it a, a, a very consistent, like go up to them in person and talk to them. I'm putting together a really nice kind of like hardbacked postcard that I'm going to be sending out that's, like possibly just going to be like a laminated kind of, oh, what's that? That really durable uh, aluminum over plastic uh, dye bond. Oh, yeah. right. Right. Yeah. Like, like I'm trying to do some stuff like that to stand out. And really in, in a, I guess in six months to a year, I'll be able to say if this way of doing it, this roundabout way was successful. But so far it's to get, you know, I sent one letter to Orem and I got an email back. That felt good. So it made me feel like I might be onto something with just spending this much time on the work itself. Oh, I think you definitely are. I mean, I, I think that, <laughs> that that has to come first. I think that for any success, I think 90% of the work comes unseen beforehand. And, and for an artist that is honing your craft and pursuing your vision of excellence and discovering what it is that you get excited about and that resonates with other people and not just doing like a one-off, but really taking the time to dive deep into that. And I know there's lots of formulas for, I, there's a thousand ways to do it. There's probably as many ways to do it as, as there are artists, but what feels the most real to me is to put the majority of your concentration and effort into the work and then start getting it out there and having that consistent strategic method of contacting the galleries and building a relationship with them and deciding who it is that you want to spend your time with. Because if you're really, if you know, the art itself is the most important thing. And if you're really invested in that, you don't really have time to mess around with galleries who may not be a good fit for you. It would just take away all your studio time. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And yeah, and I couldn't have said any of that better. And it's, yeah, there were times when a gallery would approach me and they'd approach me out of the blue. Like they, they'd have just heard about me and it's so flattering to get that. And there was a, there was a gallery in, in Asheville. It's closed since. 
and it was unfortunately named Artitude. <laughs> but they were, and they were one of the people uh, or one of the galleries that contacted me. And yeah, they had a great manager actually, Cynthia, at first, and then they got rid of her, and things kind of went south there. But everything you said about just kind of wanting to, yeah, spend your time wisely. It's 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 hard to say no when that stuff comes up, mm-hmm. and you're you know, hungry for that because you're just in the studio all the time and you're not getting any of that. So it's, so I try to keep people in mind that have, have held out and, and succeeded. Like, I don't know, random example would be, I know Sony did that, you know, they tried to buy him out so many times and he just, you know, there's lots of good examples like that. So jumping back to my, my, the spark that happened in my head a little while ago, you mentioned this reaction you got to your art. I'm really curious what your response to this will be from listening to you talk, but what do you think your role as an artist is in, in this world that we're in now? Yeah. I'm, that's what I'm actively trying to figure out because I'm at the point where, you know, I'll tell you the last few years, it's really been this kind of uh, more of a self-improvement kind of thing. I think for Mm -hmm. me, more of a sort of selfish, like, you know, if I really want to do this at like a, an Olympic level, like if I want to be really good at this and be really known, what is it going to take? What kind of routine is it going to take? And what are the hours? And at least just for the merit of the work, you know, work that I'm really proud of. So now that I'm kind of, I finally finished some, some paintings that, you know, give me some feelings of that. I'm trying to figure that out, like what the role of the artist is. And the thing I'm sort of developing into is what is kind of, sketched out a bit was this idea of this new mythology and not not to in any way to like lead that or, or be that in, entirely but just sort of contribute to this idea that we're we're going to be upended and we're going to need like an aesthetic and a poetry and all this kind of stuff to kind of like ground us and and help us get through that like i i like that idea of that being kind of a a social sort of role i can play if that makes if that makes any sense there mm-hmm. and not in a political way like a, I don't see it in that sense or like in a like just really in a in an art way whatever that exactly means there do you know do you have a sense of what that means I guess I'm trying to figure that out yeah I think sometimes artists can sort of overestimate the effect they can have on like a, a political cause or something like that and and what they end up doing is they end up kind of riding on the back of that more than they are leading any sort of leading it or changing it or adding to it in any way. So like, I don't want to attach my name. I don't want to cling on to all this stuff that's going on. I don't want to like just echo it or anything, but I guess I'm trying to, yeah, trying to figure that out still. Like how can I add some kind of visual cultural element that uh, I guess could somehow act as a sort of guide or reassurance or inspiration Mm -hmm. to still have a sense of, meaning and consistency and, and direction if everything does get upended as much as it, as it possibly could. Yeah, I'm trying to figure that out. I don't have like a solid idea of what, of what, what that, that means. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Sorry, that was so long-winded there. Yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's interesting because there's so many possible answers to that. And I think it's a reasonable question that most artists will ask of themselves at some point. What am I doing? Yeah, yeah. It's a little bit disheartening if you think that what you do is really, at the end of the day, a luxury product. Yeah. I think most artists want to have an impact and want to have more meaning to what they do than that. And some artists just want to create beauty. And and I think that that's fine. But the question, I think, needs to be asked. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree with that. And I'm trying to stay as, I think there's this, oh, who was it? Maybe like philosopher guy Dante was was writing about Nietzsche or something like that. And he just wrote about Nietzsche, like, you know, going on his emo moody hikes <laughs> through the woods and, you know, lighting a big bonfire and then basically, you know, holding every kind of cultural idea into this fire and like seeing what could survive, like what would come out. So, yeah, I, I want, I want to like, feel like I have that, that role that you're talking about, like that, like more than just, you know, a luxury commodity, like item that I'm painting here. I want, I want to feel like I'm doing more than that, but I, I don't want to trick myself either. So mm. I'm trying to be like super strict about like, if I can get that, that's great, but I don't want to deceive myself or oversell it, but it's, it's absolutely what I'm striving for. I mean, I agree with you completely on that. Can you share a story of a time when you encountered a setback or, or a challenge and what did you take away from that experience? 
Yeah, there's been plenty. I think one big one was just before I did the first painting, this vertical one named Colette, I just named after the model. Before I did that, I spent about six months on this other painting, similar size, and it hadn't made that jump yet to having these repetitions and translucencies and all this other stuff going on. It was I was kind of just painting these figures with cloth and these kind of low horizon lines with lots of clouds. And yeah, so I spent about six months on this thing and I just hated it. Like it just wasn't, I just knew it wasn't what I wanted to have done. And one day just ended up whiting it out, just painting over the whole thing. So it was a huge setback, you know, a huge chunk of time just down the drain. How long had you been working on it? Oh, probably six months. Yeah, probably about six months of time on that. So when I finally did commit to doing that, it was actually like, it actually felt a tiny bit better. It was almost like, as long as I kept anteing up more time into it, it was like just worse and worse. And I just, I just knew something was wrong. And, and, you know, I was pretty devastated to paint over it, but I was also glad that I was just admitting that it wasn't right what happened. And then, and then out of that came this whole new thing, this whole new concept with the figures and everything. So, so it was a huge setback, but it did kind of allow me to just break through to that next, that next level. Yeah, that's, that's such a, <laughs> not just with artists, I think with everybody, but that idea of what's called the sunk cost that you've already invested so much yeah, time yeah. or money into something. And so psychologically, we feel compelled to continue on and to finish it when sometimes the best thing you can do is just pull the plug. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you sunk cost in your in your painting and six months of work. That's it's gotta hurt. It hurt. It definitely hurt. It definitely hurt. <laughs> so you you're working on this this painting of Colette and and you realize this is not gonna pan out. So you whited it out. And then it sounds like from that you got to your current way of painting. That sounds so bland to say way of painting, but you know what I mean. No, no, no. Um, yeah. <laughs> So do you remember like, okay, you wiped this thing out and then was there something about the way that you had painted it prior that came back into it that led you to that realization or was it just sort of like, oh my God, I know what to do now? Yeah, it was more the latter really. It was kind of like probably in 2004 or five or so, I, I started doing these figures holding cloth basically. And it was kind of catching in the wind, real simple stuff with these low horizon lines and these skies behind them. And I was liking those paintings. And then I was, you know, adding like a bit more cloth. And then, you know, finally with this, the one that I worked on for six months, I had a lot of fabric just blowing around in it, wrapped around the figure and billowing and everything. But it still, there was like something wasn't right and painted it out and then redesigned the composition. And it just sort of happened. Yeah, it happened really fast. Like it was like, you know, slowly developing before then. And then it was, it was pretty much just like one night of doing a couple of changes and then realizing, oh, okay, this is the aesthetic I want. Like, this is what I have to do now. Which is also kind of daunting because I'm like, oh God, why do I have to like this? Like, why can't I just like... Something you know, easy. Like, and lemons. Yeah, like this is, <laughs> this is awful. This is going to take so much time to do. But I was looking at it and I'm just thinking, this is, this is it. Like, this is what I want to do or I have to do. So yeah, yeah. Happened fast. That, yeah. that change. Was it a relief then when you realized like when you got past the, oh, why do I have to pick something that is so much work? It was. It was absolutely because I, I knew that the time I was putting into it was right. Like it just was, which, you know, it's like that expression. If you come up with your why, you can put up with any how mm -hmm. kind of thing. So, yeah, as soon as I had like that and then it was just, yeah, the hours were easier. The isolation was easier, all that, you know, it just kind of, yeah, it justified itself. It sort of, in a weird way, sounds like what happened with your decision to have dresses made for your models as opposed to trying <laughs> to invent yeah. them out of, you know. Oh, yeah. So I'm, excited. I'm working with a tailor right now or a, a dressmaker designer. I'm not sure what she goes by. It. Trisha. Yeah. So I'm really excited. She took me to Joanne Fabrics and she gave me a lesson on fabrics and had me order these nice designer fabrics off, off the internet and yeah I'm, I'm pretty excited cool yeah yeah it's a whole new whole new thing and totally affordable and like yeah absolutely worth the time and you know i thought i just thought of something related to what you asked me before about reactions i've gotten from paintings and a, a really good one i got not too long ago just forgot to mention this is for the first time ever i had someone write into the local paper here and complain about a painting i did <laughs> 
it was featured there, which was amazing. You know, it was like the best thing ever to happen. And it was the the painting I finished most recently of Mary, Virgin Mary. I'm not super religious. I just always kind of wanted to, I mean, I'm not religious at all. I just, uh, I was raised Roman Catholic and wanted to do this Mary painting because it seemed like such a theme in the art world. Sort of act as like a, uh, a really important milestone work, mm-hmm. I guess, like milestone painting. And, you know, you think of Salvador Dali or something like that. Like you, you just know a lot of these artists for their, whatever their take on it was. But anyway, so did my take on it. And yeah, she, the, I was interviewed by the local paper and this person just wrote in a letter saying they were like offended by the painting because there is, there are some kind of like sexualized aspects of it, but it was just great. It was like, I was so kind of flattered that my painting could produce that. Someone, <laughs> you know, <Was> she, <laughs> so what was, the, what was the gist of what this person was saying? Were they like, this shouldn't be, what did they say? Well, it was... It, the, the kind of theme I went with was this idea that, like in the Bible, it's really vague how how Mary conceived Jesus is, is super vague. We just know like the angel Gabriel comes and says it's going to happen. And I didn't even know she was in the Quran, but she's like in the Quran too. And oh, I didn't know that. Sort of, yeah, yeah. She's in the Quran and it's the same exact story. Like angel Gabriel comes to her and sort of just, you know, some variations on it, but it's pretty much consistent. Like he just sort of says it's going to happen. And then it's, we don't know like how it actually happened. So I wanted to have Mary basically in the act of receiving God and have it be this kind of erotic painting, but, you know, like classy erotic, not like trashy or anything and respectful towards Mary. But so, yeah, so she's, she's basically getting off in the painting. And so, yeah, the complaint letter was, I think one line was, this is not how my savior was conceived and that I need to read the Bible and that she's not going to buy any more newspapers was the gist of it. So... (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Which was, which was great. You know, I'm glad I got that. And I wrote her back. I wrote a nice, nice letter back, which was a little bit, a little bit snarky, but I told her I was you know, glad that it produced a reaction and that, you know, I'm always open to advice and feedback. And I invited her to actually just draw or paint her version of how she think Mary conceived. And then we could compare notes and figure out the best possible position she was in when she received the seat of God. <laughs> Oh my God. Yeah. We'll see. <laughs> but the paper printed it. We'll, we'll see how it goes. Yeah. <laughs> Haven't heard back yet. Yeah. That would, that would definitely be playing with fire. A little bit. A, a little, little bit. bit. <laughs> I'm yeah. curious what the response, what, what response, if any, are you expecting from that? Just... I don't know. I don't know. You know, I mean, if she actually wants to draw something and submit it to the paper, I mean, I would be, that would be the best possible response ever. Not going to happen. No, I don't think it's going to happen. So we'll see. I really have no no clue at this point. I was I was grateful for the paper for printing her response and printing mine. And it just sort of made everything a lot more fun around here for, for a few weeks. <laughs> I'm not sure where to go from here. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm just imagining, like, I guess, like, I'm just kind of putting that into my known world and which is, you know, where I grew up and, and what would happen there. And I'm like, huh, that would... That would cause quite a, a heated conversation, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm curious to see. So I got to keep checking the paper. My response was a little late compared to her, her criticism. So I don't know if she saw it or not, or if she, she might have held up her, her thread and not bought any more papers. Right, right. So I've never seen it. Yeah, who knows? Who knows? So this is totally switching gears, but... That's good. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, re- I read that you're colorblind. Is that right? Oh, yeah. That is a thing. That is a thing. Is that a thing? That is. I appreciate you saving it for the end, too. Because it's, I mean, I've got the red-green deficiency Uh that a lot of guys have. And I want people to know that because it is a huge struggle. But it's like, I don't want it to be my gimmick. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I want want them to like my paintings first. and and You actually want to be known for your paintings? Exactly. Exactly. Come on, Frank. I know. I know. I know, right? Why can't I just... Buckle down and and yeah, have my have my silly gimmick. But yeah, you know my like YouTube video with violins playing in the background, <laughs> like struggling to find the color. Yeah, oh god, that. Be... This is going to be a, a this might be a weird conversation because it's like when I was a little kid, I used to wonder if everybody saw 
as an example, just random colors, right. blue the same way. Like everybody looks at the sky and says, that's blue. But my best friend's version of blue might be pink. Sure. Right? Yeah. I was a weird kid. So I would always really think about that and imagine what is what would it be like if what I see is 100% flopped from what everybody else sees. So I'm sort of thinking about that when I'm about to ask you, what do you see and how does that impact your art? Yeah. So it's it's tricky to know like exactly what I'm not seeing. Right. Yeah. But what I found is I was sort of in denial of it in college. Like I kind of just try to focus really hard to work around it. Mm -hmm. And the more I'd commit to doing that, especially like when I you know, graduated and really for years, just sort of had, had some pretty basic workarounds, but probably 2008, when I moved down here to North Carolina, I really started to just try to solve the problem, basically, just try to like make it a complete non-issue. And in doing that, I, I honed in on just how bad my color perception was. <laughs> it was like, like what I came to realize was not that, that I could just overcome it by, you know, focusing hard, but that it was probably more extreme than I thought it was. So probably coming from that habit that I had as a little kid, how would you even know that anything is wrong? Because to you, everything must look normal. Right. And I remember my, uh, I have this vivid memory of my mom in, I think, fourth grade or something. And she was where I was like transferring schools or I was going into school or something and introduced me to the principal and she knew I was colorblind. Your mom did. Yeah. yeah. So she introduced me and said, and she just like said it, you know, like a mom might say it for whatever reason. Uh huh. And he pointed to, <laughs> he pointed to this a wall, which was gray, asked me what color it was. And I said, gray. And I just remember my mom rolling her eyes because, <laughs> you know, if it was red, I'd say it was gray, right? Like, if it, you know, it's kind of like that issue or, uh -huh. you know, I, I would, gray is just such a default to go to anyway. Yeah. Then later she told me, yeah, I didn't like that principle very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He just kind of did it in a smug way. Like, look, he's not colorblind. You know, he knows gray. He knows gray. So it was a gray wall. Yeah, it was a gray wall. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> what was the point yeah, of that? So there's no, there's, yeah, just one big circular black hole of, yeah. Right. Yeah, nothing, nothing to be gained there. Right. So the biggest workaround I've got now is I'll actually hire people to come in and just kind of help me. Like I'll, I'll have my reference photo or reference image or whatever it is. And we'll look at the, that object and kind of color dissect it. And I usually have a vague idea, you know, of where it's at, but they'll kind of guide me. Like if you imagine going bowling and they put those big blow up things in the gutters, mm -hmm. you know, so I can't, you can't get a gutter ball. Like those, what, that's what those people do for me basically. So I'll take notes on sort of the ingredients that go into the color. And then I'll also usually I'll mix up like a gradient of say 10 colors for like the, the particular skin tone of the model I'm working on. Mm -hmm. It'll be like light to dark and it'll be this kind of gradient then I'll pre-tube it. I'll mix up big piles of paint, put it in empty tubes. And then I'll have that as my kind of ballpark range. And then I'll, I'll manipulate it from there. And that's that's been the biggest help, just asking for help. I tried all kinds of devices that would like scan the color and give me the red, green, blue, like, you know, percentages and things like that. But it's just nothing beats just having somebody sort of help me in the beginning stages. I love that though. So that, I mean, <laughs> it's such a simple thing, but the, the most effective thing is to ask for help when you need it. Exactly. Which none of us want to do. No. And I hated leading up to that, you know, hated it. And then first time I did it, it was just so much better than the other like 95 little systems I had worked out. Mm -hmm. Saved me so much time that, and it was nice to realize that like I was, I was close. It was just definitely not good enough on my own. Like the figure is either going to look green or it's going to look too beige. Like I'm not going to get it. And I still pr stay pretty muted with the palette a lot of times, but it's at least like I'll have them kind of, we'll create like a map on the figure itself where I'll circle areas that they tell me are like spikes in pink, for example. Uh, so more saturated areas, you literally write that out on the canvas. Exactly. Yeah. So I'll just, I'll just have that all mapped out and I'll even have like a percentage system, like where's the most, where's the least. So if I have that kind of map, then, and I've got the colors pre-mixed and stuff, and then usually then I can do a pretty, a pretty decent job. I'm partially imagining how that works and just going, it's so efficient. 
the way that you do it, drawing things out and making notes on on the canvas, which is some, even though I'm not colorblind, I know that's something that would definitely make my painting faster and more efficient, but I won't do it. I'm sure I'll never do it. I think it would for painters, but it, it might also slow you down in a way that kind of, you know, would take away something like a really another positive element of it. So it could go both ways on that. True. But yeah, so like I've got this, like you said, this really efficient kind of formulaic approach that I've got to take in the beginning to just have this pretty clear map of where I'm going. But the exciting thing, this goes back to the whole like gene therapy stuff. There's this guy, Dr. Jay Neitz, and he's cured colorblindness with gene therapy. Really? Yeah, cured it. Like not only cured it, he can actually give us more cones than we naturally have. Well, he could give us another yellow or another red. Like it's, it's pretty extreme what could happen. So it's not approved by the FDA. I heard him on a podcast and actually I knew of him just by, you know, Googling. And then I heard him on radio lab. And then one night actually of just frustration with some color stuff, I just called his lab in Seattle and took a lucky guess and like put in the last three letters of his name for the extension or whatever it was. And he picked up and we no talked way. for like 20 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. And he's, he's a really nice guy. And, you know, he said, I can come check out the lab sometime. And we were just talking about the FDA and him getting approval and like where his company's at. And it's not high on the list of things to approve right now. Right. And there's plenty of like way more important things that the FDA is looking at, you know, child cancer treatments. And I understand. So it's not like this isn't a life threatening thing, but I think at some point in my life, I'm going to be able to get that done. So I'm really excited to see like what you said before, just keeping this approach that I've got super formulaic, like mapping out, but then actually being able to see red and green with that on top of it. And I'm, I'm excited for that. That's going to be a good day. Yeah. That's so crazy. I just can't imagine what that, what that would be like. I'm trying to remember now it had to be radio lab. I can't imagine anyone else doing a story like this, but they did do it an episode on color and color perception. Right. And there was something about butterflies and how, They've done some tests that artists can actually see more colors than quote unquote normal people do. And they were trying to figure out if that's because we've trained ourselves to or we have a propensity for that, which kind of led to an interest in the arts or in the visual world. I feel like I listened to that like 10 years ago, like a long time ago. So I'm like, I'm reaching now to try to remember exactly what they, what it was. But I remember I was just completely fascinated by how the cones work and how we actually do see color and the differences in, in creatures, insects versus mammals versus human beings and, and how, how each has adapted their vision in order to survive. Yeah. Yeah. And how we're kind of, uh, so far behind some things like shrimp, for example, with that kind of thing. Like they've got like 16 cones, the mantis shrimp or something like that. I mean, yes, that was it. Yeah. 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 And that's just, that's just, I can't even imagine. I mean, we've got three, you know, is the average. And then you've got, I guess some women, I think it's like one in a, I don't know, million or however many women have tetrachromacy, I think it's called or something like that, where, where they have four cones, basically. I think they have like a yellow cone as well. Okay. And yeah, so they had one of those people that was confirmed that and it can only happen in women. I think that, like naturally, it can't happen in men to have that fourth cone, I don't think. Uh-huh. So they, yeah, they had her, like you said, kind of up against a, a landscape painter, a guy. And they were showing them these like subtle different shades. And they tied and everything, which... <laughs> it's incredible. Yeah, I don't know what I expected from it. But it, you know, it'd be awesome if she just did have this freak ability that like the landscape painter couldn't compete with at all. But <laughs> I would bet if she was also a landscape painter, though. Yeah. I bet she could beat him. You know what I mean? Totally. Because she's just pure talent with that, right? And he's like slaving away. But yeah, if talent, if she trained, then I don't think he'd stand the chance. Like if she just was subtly looking at different greens all day. Yeah. Yeah. It's so crazy. I love that stuff. That must have been so amazing to talk to him. What was his name? The doctor that you mentioned? Jay Neitz, if I'm pronouncing his name right. I mean, I, I just must have sounded like this ridiculous fan, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would do that. I would. I mean, that would. That's something I would do. That's why I loved your story so much. <laughs> and then I would just Thanks. geek out on him. Just be like, "What about this? What about that? What happens here?" Oh yeah, I was just asking these ridiculous questions, and he, you know, was he was just so patient and nice. And yeah, I really 
I hope he does get some kind of approval at some point, or, or maybe I can just show up in his lab and give him 50 bucks or something. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> I'll be your guinea pig. <laughs> and I know he says people have tried that. So, oh, know. really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Like people that just, especially if it's job dependent, like I think pilots and things like that have oh. tried to kind of get that done. But I don't, I don't know if he's given out the free freebies yet. Probably not. I'm sure there's quite a bit of liability attached to that. <laughs> it's a little, right? Yeah. Just a little. So. <laughs> So last question before we wrap it up, what's your dream project? If there was no restrictions on time or money, what would you create? Wow. So, I mean, you've got infinite supplies, you have infinite space and no restrictions on your time. You know, I don't give that enough thought, like those, those elements, Mm -hmm. but I would say, uh, I also don't want to sound like too sure of myself, but I'm, I mean, I'm really excited about what I'm working on now and I haven't. I haven't thought in a sense like, oh, I wish, I just wish I had more of this so I could just do. The only thing I want more of right now is just time. So the studio space is enough. I got enough paint. I guess I just need that pile of money right now. And <laughs> and I would I would probably want to do like a, and maybe I'm just not being imagined enough. You, you got me thinking, I'm going to think about this. I'll probably, maybe I'll email you an even better answer. But uh, <laughs> I've just got these visions of these sort of like Oracle women with these skulls. And these kind of ominous backdrops and stuff. And I want to do a bunch of them. So like, that's my, if I could somehow just have the the time and the money to do that, like that would, right now, that would be like waking up to a dream every day. Yeah, that would be great. I would love that. Awesome. That sounds really cool. But it's a good question. I'm going to, I'm going to mull that over and see if I come up with some kind of like Slav epic, like Muka kind of like, you know, dream project here or something. Good. I want to hear it. All right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Frank, thank you so much for talking to me. This has been a lot of fun and really interesting. I'm going to have to go back and find that Radio Lab episode, if it is a Radio Lab episode. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I think it's my favorite one that they've done. I mean, so many great people in there. And yeah, thank you for having me on here. This has been great. Glad I got to be a guest and made my month here easily. A big thank you again to Frank for such a great conversation. Show notes for this episode are on SavvyPainter.com. Just click on the podcast tab to see some of Frank's paintings and get links to all of the artists and resources that we talked about in this episode. Savvy Painter, Gamblin Artist Colors, and Trakel Art Supplies are teaming up together to do our first online art competition. Artist Carol Marine will be jurying the show. You might remember that Carol was a guest on the Savvy Painter. She's a painter herself and the founder of DailyPaintWorks.com. First place winner will receive $500 in merchandise from both Gamblin and Trakel, plus a cash prize of $250, but that's not all. The first place winner will also be a guest on the Savvy Painter podcast. So if you win first prize, you get your work in front of tens of thousands of people, a thousand dollars worth of art supplies to paint to your heart's content and some cold hard cash. Entries are being accepted from now until October 29th, 2017. Go to SavvyPainter.com and click on the call to entries tab for more information. I can't wait to see the great work that you submit. Good luck. One more thing I want to let you know, this year you can expect a lot more workshops from Savvy Painter. If you are an artist who struggles with getting painting time in or feels like you're always busy but never really moving forward with your art, then my workshops just might interest you. Past workshops include Mindset Mastery, a five-week online workshop to help you get past the roadblocks that keep you from painting. In it, we tackle the inner critic, fears of artists, and setting yourself up for a successful creative day. The workshop, How to Develop a Relationship with the Right Gallery, helps several artists find the right gallery and show their work. So if this is something that interests you, you can go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop and get on the email list. This is separate from the main list that tells you when a new episode comes out. This is just for the workshop. So you don't get quite as many emails, but when you do, there's always something really good happening. Sign up now and get a downloadable PDF with case studies that tell you exactly how three artists pushed through barriers that were getting in the way of their studio time. You can, for example, learn how Rhonda went from not wanting to call herself an artist to getting her very first solo show. Also, listen to an introverted artist describe how she built her confidence and then spoke in front of an audience of her peers. 
and you can discover the tools that Samantha used to take back her power after a decade of believing that she had no, I'm putting air quotes there, she had no talent. So again, go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop to reserve your place on the list. When you sign up, you get that downloadable case studies that I mentioned, but more importantly, you get exclusive invites to upcoming workshops. Most of the time when I launch a new program, it sells out before I ever announce it publicly. So reserve your spot now at SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop. Until next week, this is Antrice Wood with the Savvy Painter podcast. Thank you so much for listening.